Good morning, everybody. I'm looking at the clock back there, and I think I have quite a bit of time. I'm going to tell you a story about something that happened in my life many, many years ago. In fact, it was even before I started going with my wife, even dating her. And I had an experience that helps me to understand many of the scriptures that deal with the shepherd. I was uh, called into the president's office one day of uh, Kentucky Christian College, Brother Lowell Lesbian. He says, Bill, we're looking for a preacher. And I said, okay, where, where do you want me to preach? He said, well, there's a church down around Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky, that their minister was out helping to uh, a farmer you know, get his crops in. And he got hurt. And he's in the hospital. They want somebody to go in for him. He says, I have a way for you to go down, and I uh, would like for you to go down and preach for that particular congregation that they might be able to uh, have uh, services that day. I, I think that I can understand some of the ones that preached for me while I was in the hospital because of that circumstance. And I was to go down with one of the professors. I don't know whether my kids remember uh, Lloyd Shubal or whatever uh, Shubal, uh, they call him uh, Shopback. But uh, Shubal uh, was one of the professors of Old Testament history. And uh, very, very tough as far as his classes were concerned, but very personal outside. So I was to go down with him. He was to drop me off at the church and pick me up that night after church was over and bring me back. So I went down. That was, it was not my first sermon. My first sermon was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania at the, uh, uh, oh boy, my name for him, very good, but one of the churches there. And uh, I had a 20-minute sermon and I preached in five minutes because I was so scared. And I went down and I was preaching, I went down to preach there and I had a good fellowship and one of the elders came to me afterwards and he said, we are going to have you for lunch today. I have you over for lunch. And I went there with him and we had lunch together. Found out while we were talking that this particular elder had a very, a lot of, a livestock. He had about 20, 25 sheep that he took care of when he was in the, uh, when he was uh, taking care of the livestock. And he says he had to go out and feed the sheep if I wanted to go with him. Being a city slicker, living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, never being around this type of animal before, I said, sure. And I went out and was talking to the gentleman as we went out. He got the feed that he was going to feed with the sheep and he started to call them. And they all came up and he dumped the food in the troughs that they were there eating. He looked around and says, he says, I'm missing one. It is, uh, he said he was missing one. He says, I'm concerned about this one that I'm missing. For the simple reason she was pregnant. And she was about to do, so I'm afraid that she's had her baby somewhere out in the pasture, and we're going to have to go out and find the babies and bring them in so I can take care of them inside. It was wintertime. So he got me a pair of boots that I put on because we were walking through the pasture and you had to watch where you walked. I think you understand what I mean by that. And we started walking through there, and he started calling the name of the sheep. I cannot remember the name of the sheep. We walked through that pasture, and finally we heard the ba, ba of the sheep calling. And we followed that until we came to a grove of trees where inside that grove she had twin lambs. They were just a born. In fact, some of them, if my memory serves me right, they were so, so wet with the liquid of the uh, fluid that they were uh, born in. 
And he looked at me and says, Bill, I'm going to have to have help. He said, will you carry one of these rams back so I can put them inside the barn and take care of them? I said, I sure will. I don't know whether you know it, but the proper way to carry one of the lambs is to wrap it around your neck with it being on your back. So he wrapped it around my neck. He said, now you hold on to its feet until we get to the barn. And he picked up the other and did the same with that. And all the time that I was carrying that sheep in, the mother sheep didn't like it one bit. I was a stranger. She didn't know me and she kept butting my back. And let me know that she wasn't uh, enjoying my fa the fact that I was carrying her lamb. So when we got back to the barn, I, I, we put the uh, sheep down. And I petted the mother lamb, and she took to me after I gave the lamb back to her. Well, I learned from that about how a shepherd really cares for his sheep. And how much the uh, sheep are so dependent upon the shepherd for what they were doing. And when I read in God's word concerning the sheep of the pasture and how I, when I see uh, the idea of the uh, 23rd Psalm the Lord is my shepherd we'll refer to that a little bit later when I read in John the 10th chapter where Jesus said he was the good shepherd these passages take a new life to me as a result of the experience I had way back then now, I'm not going to take the time to read the 10th chapter of the book of John. Where several times in that chapter he says, I am the good shepherd, or I am the shepherd of the sheep. Where he says several times that he was the door of the sheepfold. That the only way a person can legitimately get into the sheep, where the sheep are is by going through him. Then I, I want you to know that there is abundant passages in the Word of God concerning sheep shepherds who do not fulfill their duty the way they should. Even in this particular passage, he says, He that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up over a seven of the way, the same as a thief and a robber. Down in the fifth verse, I went in the wrong place. In the fifth verse, and a stranger will they not follow. They that will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. The tenth verse of this passage of scripture. The thief cometh not but to for any man in the room, he shall, oh I'm sorry, uh, uh, any man of the this tenth verse, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. And then, then we find in the twelfth uh, verse this passage that he that is a hireling and not the shepherd whose own sheep are not, see as the wolf cometh, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catches them, and scattereth the sheep. I, I, when I read that passage of scripture, I'm, I'm sure glad that it was the mother sheep that was bugging me, uh, because I had a lamb, not a wolf coming to bite me. That, uh, that's uh, neither here or there. I have in our notes, a number of passages of scriptures out of the Old Testament that deal with the shepherds of the children of Israel and how they were not fulfilling what they should be doing. In Zechariah, 11th chapter, the first three verses, listen to the will, the third verse, listen to the will of the shepherds. Their rich pastures are destroyed. Listen to the, to the roar of the lions, lest thicket of the bird is ruined. That's out of the NIV. 
In Ezekiel, Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter, first four verses, it begins by, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of the uh, pasture, declares the Lord. And he emphasizes the judgment upon the sheep that were destroying the people of that particular time. In Ezekiel, the 34th chapter, uh, in the first six verses, you will find woes to the shepherds who were not doing the things that were going to be done. In the New Testament, James, the first chapter, the fifth chapter, I'm sorry, the first verse, my children, my brother, be not many masters, and that is the same as a shepherd, knowing that we shall receive their greater condemnation. I am the good shepherd, Jesus said, and know my sheep and, the, and are known of mine. I want you to think just for a moment. In our day and age, as you look around the sheep, the people that are preaching things that are not in God's word, the people that are really scattering the sheep and causing division, I think fall into the same category as the shepherds of the children of Israel that were destroying the people back then. How interesting to note that people say, I, I, I am of this particular congregation, or I am of this particular congregation. I in no way am judging them as far as what they are doing, because they believe without a shadow of a doubt that they're doing the will of God. And brother, I'm going to tell you, some of the things they preach and some of the things they teach are contradictory to what God's Word says. And I think that we need to be careful what, what we teach and what we believe and how we believe it and do the things that we need to do. It is so, so important, I believe, that as children of God that we abide by what the Word of God says. And not what man says. I have told you before about talking to a preacher in Tonsville, Pennsylvania when I preached up there. He was on the steps of his church and I'm not sure glad I didn't have the steps that he had to be able to climb. And we were talking about the various denominations and what uh, they taught. And he says, you know, I don't believe everything that the other churches teach. And I said, I don't even and he looked at me one day after we had talked a little bit. He says, I believe what you believe. I says, what do you mean by that? He says, well, I believe that Baptist is the remission of sin. I looked at him and said, you preach in the Baptist church? He says, I believe we ought to take communion every Sunday, the Lord's Supper every Sunday. And again, my response was, you believe in the Baptist church? Interesting how his conversation quickly told me that he was raised in the Church of Christ. And that he was baptized into the Church of Christ. But he decided to preach in the Baptist Church. His last name is Zin, Z-I-N-N. -N. And I asked him what ever made him change from the Church of Christ to the word he was preaching. He said, well, the pay for the preacher is much greater in the Baptist church than it is in the Church of Christ. Shepherds. Shepherds that are leading congregations astray for whatever reason they believe. John wrote the passage John 10, 1 through 16. About Jesus being the good shepherd, and Jesus did teach this. And he emphasized very strongly that there was only one way, one way into heaven, into the sheepfold. And that way was Jesus Christ himself. He emphasized that he was the door 
of the sheepfold. No man entereth in but through him. I am told, and I don't know how true this is, but I am told that back in the days of Jesus Christ when the uh, shepherd got his sheep into the sheepfold, that the door had no gate. But the shepherd slept at the door so he could control who entered and control the sheep to keep them in the sheepfold. But yet on the other hand, there are passages in Scripture that deal with the Good Shepherd. I think the most famous passage in Scripture that deals with the Good Shepherd is probably the Psalm is 23, and I want you to listen to this as I read it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He hideth me, uh, leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for my name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou knowest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. All through this passage, you find the good things that God does for us. He cares. He loves us because we have the sheep in this pasture. He leads us beside the still waters. He leads us into green pastures. He leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. He comforts. He comforts us whenever we need comfort. He restores us whenever we need to be restored. He provides our needs. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And he heals. Either he anoints our heads with oil, which was a sign of healing. Brethren, I, I think our only shepherd ought to be Jesus Christ. And he is the good shepherd. All that follows him are found in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John. He loves, emphasized in the Gospel of John. He knows us, and we know him. He leads us but through the Holy Spirit. He protects us, God be in the door. He lays down his life for us. Scarcely for a good man would some even dare to die. Yet while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. One of the passages, the verses in this passage, that I love dearly, I have not yet fully understand it. The thief cometh not for to steal, nor to kill, nor to, but, uh, and to destroy. That for to steal, and, and to kill, and to destroy. I stopped there a little while ago. But I want you to see what follows. I am come that they may have life, and they might have it more abundantly. I want you to think about the abundant life. I, I, I know that sometimes we murmur. Uh, we might complain about a few things in our life. But I can look back over my 88 years what I can remember of it. And God has never failed me. God has never let me down. And when things go wrong, he's given me the strength to be able to overcome and do and do. And I can understand 
what it means to have the abundant life. I, I like what Nancy said when she came in. Not Nancy, but uh, Alice, I'm sorry. She says, it's going to be a great day. It's going to be a great day. It's going to be friends, fellowship, and food. If you call ice cream food. I do. I think that's a good attitude. It's going to be a great day, and every day ought to be a day of the Lord. We ought to begin in the morning with thanksgiving to God for the fact that we were able to wake up and have life. We, we are throughout the day give thanks for the food that we eat and the blessings that God has given to us. And when we go to bed at night, we ought to thank Him for the day that He has given to us. I know of no better life to live than the life that we have in Christ. Years ago, when I first preached at the Tagana Church, there was a man that came to church there. His first name happened to be Shirley. I can't remember what his last name was, but I remember his first name because of the strangeness of the name. But every Sunday morning, when we sang the invitation, I'd look over to where he was standing. He would have the back of the pulpit grip so hard that you could see his hands turning red because he was stopping the circulation in his hands. Cecil Todd held a revival out of the uh, horse form on Route 10. I don't know whether you remember that or not. But he was there one night, and some of the people had gone about got talking to him and asked him if uh, uh, he wanted to become a Christian. He said yes, so they took him up front to talk to Cecil. And I ran up as quick as I could because I wanted to be able to hear his confession and see his baptism. Cecil said to him, he said, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ of some God? He said, I sure do. And I remember that was his answer. I sure do. There was all kinds of enthusiasm. Then Cecil asked him, will you accept him as your Savior? Shirley looked at him on his head. No. I have no idea why. But there were times, I was at the time working with uh, Hayflick and Steinberg, the CPA firm, and there were times that I would see him walking down the streets of uh, Huffington. And when he saw me, he would cross the street and sometimes in the middle of the block because he didn't want to stop. Shortly, shortly after G.C. Richards became minister of the church in Gondot. I was walking down 3rd Avenue. And I looked up and down coming, down 3rd Avenue, the same side of the street, was Shirley. And as he saw me, he started to run towards me. And I was shocked. Because normally he would have avoided me. He ran up right to me and threw his arms around my neck, hugged me, and pulled back and he said, Phil, I was baptized last Sunday morning. I said, I'm thrilled to death. And I remember what his response was. You're not any more thrilled than what I am. He says, if I had known that Christian life would have been as good as it is right now, I would have done it many, many, many years ago. We live the abundant life. It is greater than any life that uh, I can see in this world. Oh, we're living in a world there's hatred, there's sin, there's racism, there's inequities, you name it, that's there. In Christ, we have unity. When my wife and I got married, one of the hymns that we love so dearly was Savior like a shepherd leads. 
We had his son right before the wedding march. Listen to the words. Savior, like a shepherd, leave us much we need thy tender care. In thy, thy pleasant pastures feed us for our use thy fields prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us not we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thy will. We are gone, thou dost befriend us, be the guardian of our way. Keep thy flock from sin, defend us, seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, oh, hear us when we pray. Thou hast promised to receive us, poor and useful though we be. Thou hast mercy to relieve us, so grace to cleanse and power to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, we will early turn to thee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, we will early turn to thee. Early let us seek thy favor, early let us do thy will. Blessed Jesus, Lord and only Savior, with our love, bosom still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, loved us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, loved us still. I think that hymn ought to be the motto for every couple that gets married. That hymn ought to be the the, every couple, person that becomes a Christian, Savior, like a shepherd, lead me. Because he loves. Because he cares. Because he comforts. Because he protects. Because he heals. And because he restores. We're going to be singing our invitation. What was it, Marilyn? Just as I am. Just as I am, first verse only. If there's any here that makes, needs to make this decision, we ask that you come.